Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello again, I'm Town Councilman Frank Moriello, here with another edition of Colony Close Up. Today I'm here with Cretian Berg and Tim Ryan. Uh, Crate is our sanitary engineer for the Pure Waters Department and Tim is our maintenance supervisor for Pure Waters. And we're here today to talk about our Pure Waters Department, which is our sanitary sewer department. And what I'd like to do is, is start with Crate first. Crate, tell us what is Pure Waters? Well, Frank, Pure Waters is a division of the Par Department of Public Works, uh, as well as the divisions of Latham Water Pure Waters Highway, Environmental Services, and the Bureau of Engineering, which all provide utility services to the town residents. Pure Waters is the sanitary sewer department, and we are responsible for the safe and efficient collection, transportation, and treatment of wastewater within the town. Uh, we're often confused with the Latham Water District, which is a drinking water supply, and also with the Highway Division, which is responsible for the town's stormwater system, mainly just because of our name, Pure Waters. So. Okay, now you mentioned uh, sanitary wastewater and, and, and stormwater. What is the difference between the two? Right, there is a very important difference between the two. Sanitary wastewater is generated from residential, commercial, and industrial sources, and it includes any liquid waste from sinks, tubs, toilets, restaurants, and manufacturing processes. Stormwater is uncontaminated water, uh, groundwater, rainwater from roof runoff, street runoff, driveway runoff, also from sump pumps and footing drains. And it's very important these systems are separated. The sanitary and the storm sewer systems both collect and transport water to two different locations. Now why should they be separated and where are the two locations that they're, they're sent to? Well, we're very fortunate in the town of Colony that in the early part of the 20th century when sanitary sewers were really first introduced here, that the sanitary and the storm sewers were separated. The sanitary sewer uh, is collected and transported to the Town of Colony Wastewater Treatment Facility on the Mohawk River or also to the Albany County Sewer District North Plant in Manans, depending upon the geography in the town and really where your home is located because there's two separate watersheds. The storm water is uh, transported and empties directly into the lakes, rivers, and streams of the town. So there's really no treatment for the uncontaminated rainwater and groundwater that's conveyed by the storm sewer system, whereas the sanitary sewer is treated at a wastewater treatment facility before it's discharged into the river. Okay, and you said there are, there are, are two, two districts really in the town. Some of the, uh, the wastewater, waste sanitary wastewater is treated at our plant and uh, some at the Albany County plant in Minans. Could you tell us uh, pretty much where the line would be Roughly speaking, the line follows the north way at the beginning of the town line near the village and follows up into Latham and almost into the Bout area where then it uh, diverts over towards the Cohoes line. And that is called the Hudson, uh, the Hudson watershed, anything on the east side of that line. The Mohawk watershed is on the west and north side. And that's really what the town of Colony's wastewater facility treats is any of the waste that's generated west of the north way and north of um, approximately Columbia Street area. Okay, okay, and I know the majority of the town uh, does have sewer service, and I, I understand there are some pockets that uh, do not have any sewer service. Are, are there still, what areas of the town still do not have sewer service? The, you are correct, there are areas of the town that still do not have sanitary sewer service. Uh, it's our goal in Pure Water to eventually service the entire town with municipal public sewer service. However, right now, mainly the western portion of the town in the Albany Pine Bush area, uh, there is a, a pocket in that area that does not have sanitary sewer service, mainly because of the population density and, and the growth towards a, a, the Pine Bush area, that development is somewhat uncertain in that area of the town. And then also in the, in the currently developing north portion of the town, along Loudon Road, really from Skirmahorn Road up north, is where the sanitary sewer system ends for the town. 
but there are plans to extend the sewer in all of those areas eventually to service all of our residents. Now, other than the, uh, the unsightly discharge of uh, wastewater into a river, why do we spend money on, on treating and collecting uh, the wastewater? Ed, that's a very important question for us to answer, Frank. Sanitary wastewater collection and treatment uh, not only protects the environment, but it also protects the public health. Uh, waterborne diseases are very prevalent in the world, except for in the developed nations where sanitary sewer collection and treatment is prevalent and also where drinking water treatment is, is very actively pursued. As a comparison in the developing world, uh, waterborne diseases are the leading cause of death for children under the age of five, whereas here in the United States that is not the case, mainly because of water and wastewater treatment. And it was the British Medical Journal uh, in 2007 actually stated that sanitation was the single most important medical advancement in the last 150 years. So by protecting uh, the nation's water supply through drinking water treatment and wastewater collection and treatment, we're really preventing uh, the transmission of diseases and protecting the public health. Well, that, no, that, that's interesting, and, I, and as you mentioned that, that does sound, uh, it sounds very logical, and, and, I, and I can understand that. Um, yeah, you've convinced me that proper collection um, and treatment of the sanitary water system is, is important in protecting public health. And, but um, how does Pure Waters do this? Can you uh, tell us about how it's collected, how it's treated, and, and where the water is discharged after it's treated? Absolutely. We do this in Pure Waters by a number of ways. Number one is we ensure that the designs for sanitary sewer system meet current codes and requirements and that the capacity to handle wastewater not only today but also in the future is incorporated into all the projects that we do. We also verify that the sewer is installed in accordance with these requirements and in accordance with the plans by providing proper inspection of all the sewers that are installed in the town, both on private property and in the public right of way. Because the sanitary sewers that are installed on private property eventually connect to the town system and it's important to verify for not only the protection of the resident, but the protection of the town, that those sewers are installed uh, properly. We also perform corrective and preventive maintenance on the sanitary sewer system by pipeline cleaning, by pump station maintenance, and by maintaining the treatment plant and the systems that operate uh, there as well. We conduct regular condition assessments of the sanitary sewer system to verify that the sewers that are in the ground are actually operating at capacity and properly now, and that we don't need to uh, continue to expend dollars in a certain area. We can actually, by conducting regular investigations, we can better allocate the repair dollars to those areas that need it the most. Uh, we actually have about 26 employees right now that maintain uh, 350 miles of pipeline that range in diameter from four to six inches to about 48 inches in diameter and from four feet deep to about 45 feet deep. Uh, 9,000 manholes, 27 sewage pumping stations, and a six million gallon a day wastewater treatment facility on the Mohawk River. How many, uh, how many uh, millions of gallons do we treat, I would say, on a, on a daily, monthly, and annual basis? On an average day, we're currently treating about four million gallons a day. And that uh, obviously changes throughout the year. In the springtime, it may be more. In the summer, it may be less as the groundwater table raises and lowers. And once we get it actually a little bit later, we'll probably talk about the uh, introduction of stormwater into the sanitary sewer system. But that is really uh, one of the issues that raises the amount of water we have to treat during the springtime at the plant. And that was an issue that was brought up, uh, I can recall, uh, a couple of years ago when there was a, an older development in Latham in, in which the houses were built with their, their sump pumps uh, emptying directly into the sanitary sewer system and, and we actually had to go into the neighborhood and uh, I think reconstruct the sewer system, the sanitary system. So uh, that was no longer the case. And, and, and that you bring that up, that's an important thing. What is the issue with having your stormwater uh, actually go into the sanitary system? What's, what's, what problems does that cause? That is a very big problem for us. Uh, as I mentioned, between the dry weather flow and the wet weather flow at the wastewater treatment plant, that's the difference between the wet season and the dry season. That flow is attributed directly to 
intentional and unintentional introduction of groundwater and rainwater into the public sanitary sewer system. The importance of keeping these systems separate, not only from an environmental perspective of keeping the sanitary sewer in its system and separate, all the way through the wastewater treatment process, uh, in order to keep that wastewater out of the environment, and likewise for the storm sewer system, to keep the uncontaminated rainwater and groundwater in its own system. And very important, not only environmentally, but also financially. The town is required to collect, pump, and treat every drop of sanitary wastewater in the town that's produced here. And any uncontaminated water from sump pumps or footing drains or roof drains, sidewalks, um, driveways that is introduced into the sanitary sewer needs to be collected, pumped, and treated as if it were wastewater. So therefore, we're really paying to uh, treat water that would not normally need to be treated if it were introduced into the storm sewer system as really the intention is, is to have that done. Uh, it's very important for our residents to know that if their sump pump or footing drain is connected into the sanitary sewer system, that it should be separated and put into the storm sewer so that um, we can not only help uh, alleviate any overflows because that uncontaminated water also taxes the sanitary sewer system, but also it, it can result in a cost savings. Okay, well, that's, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Is, is most of our system um, gravity fed or, or, I know we have pumping stations uh, that also pump the sewage towards the plants, but how much of the system is gravity fed and, and uh, how much of uh, the system is, is really uh, moved through with, uh, with pumps? There's a combination of answers to your question. The, the majority of our system is a gravity system. And just to explain a little further, with the gravity system, uh, water flows and is conveyed through pipes underground based upon the way the pipes are oriented. So we try to maintain a consistent slope and use gravity to our advantage so that water flows downhill. We have the pipes facing downhill. And eventually, though constructing sewers at 50 or 60 feet deep would be uh, very cost prohibitive. So what we would do in that case is once the sewer uh, reaches a depth that it's really not economical to construct it at that depth any further, that's where we would put a wastewater pumping station. And those pumping stations collect a number of gravity lines would feed to that station where there's a, a subsurface vault that collects sewage and then eventually is pumped up to a higher elevation into another system that also is gravity. And that may flow to a secondary pump station, which is then lifted again. So sometimes you may hear these stations referred to as lift stations rather than pump stations. But as I mentioned, we have 27 of those in the town. And they convey water both in the Hudson and the Mohawk slopes to the appropriate treatment plants. Do they work like a, uh, a sump pump would work in that you would fill that, that well with that sanitary discharge and when it reaches a certain level, the pumps would turn on and then move it out into the system heading towards the, uh, the plant? Is that how that works? That's correct. At this time, that's the way the majority of our uh, systems operate is by when the uh, wastewater in the wet well is, uh, is the tank. And when that gets to a certain elevation, the pumps would turn on and they would pump the wastewater to a different point and then that would follow uh, the gravity line again to perhaps another pump station. Those pump stations operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to uh, respond to alarms. Those are all integrated into a central network that we monitor continuously to verify that those pumps are operational. Um, so there is an alarm system, so if a pump fails to operate, um, you are signaled that there's an issue there. Is there a backup pump or a backup generation system that works? Maybe uh, Tim I was can answer. Maybe Tim can answer that question. Probably elaborate point, Frank. Uh, we do have backup pumps and generators on a lot of our stations. Uh, typically, at a wastewater pumping station, there's a, what we call a lead pump, which uh, would operate and basically pump uh, most of the wastewater that's received into the wet well. Uh, in the event that that pump fails, for example. There's another float uh, that's triggered by the wastewater, and it would it would basically operate a second pump or a lag pump, uh, which would basically handle the flows. Um, a lot of times, if the primary pump fails, there'll be an alarm sent to 
after hours it'd be late from water who would then page our on-call senior and he would respond and you know address the situation to find out the cause of the alarm now a lot of our stations do also have um, the generators like you had mentioned and uh, in the event that there's a power failure the uh, generators uh, through a transfer switch would operate and uh, basically keep the pump station running until power has been restored all right and how much maintenance and service uh, do these uh, pump stations require? Well, actually, that's a good question. Uh, depending on the age of the station, uh, they may require different levels. Uh, some of our pump stations are getting up towards 25, 30 years old, so they might require a little more maintenance than, say, a station that's just been put online. Uh, typically, I would say half of the 27 pump stations would require weekly preventative maintenance. And what I mean by that is a crew would go out and basically make a pump station round, which would entail checking the pumps, making sure everything's in good order, checking the grounds, making sure uh, you know the pumps are operating correctly, the, uh, the wastewater levels are set and operating properly. And uh, a lot of the other stations that are smaller flows, we might put that on a bi-weekly pump station round. So uh, it varies depending on the size of the uh, pump station and the amount of flow coming into them. And as far as the, the, uh, the rest of the system is concerned, um, I know occasionally we have sewer breaks right. and, and we have to uh, address those uh, very quickly. But um, what is the, how often do we have uh, sewer breaks? What is, what is the, the occurrence? Usually, is, do they occur more in the winter than they do in the summer or spring or fall? And, and how do we address those uh, sewer breaks? Well, um, I've been here for about a year and a half, and I have to say, as far as an average yearly breaks, um, I would say maybe, maybe five, six, seven a year. Uh, it really varies. Um, as you guys had talked about earlier, the, um, the springtime, when there's a lot of uh, snow, snow melt off and um, basically a lot of runoff, we have some issues where maybe some clean storm water is getting into the uh, sanitary sewer. And that a lot of times puts uh, it over it puts an overburden on the sanitary sewer um, that may uh, help cause a break. But when that does happen, usually we'll get a call for, say, for example, an overflowing manhole um, or a sinkhole in the road. And when that happens, usually we act pretty quickly to uh, to one you know stop the um, anybody from getting into the sinkhole or hurting themselves, and we secure the area and. Uh, as far as emergency breaks go, I would say maybe about half a dozen a year on average. Well, that's, that's not too bad. And uh, as Tim mentioned, it, there's not necessarily a particular time of year for us, as, as some people may see with the water system. Uh, it's very evident when there's a water main break, whereas with a sanitary sewer, it's very seldom pressurized. So sometimes those breaks develop over time. And that's really why our proactive uh, maintenance program is so important. We use a a number of pieces of equipment, especially pieces of equipment, uh, to maintain the sanitary sewer system and also to investigate problems before they become uh, catastrophic, so to speak. The, uh, waste, the collection section that Tim is responsible for operates a series of high pressure and high pressure vacuum cleaning equipment. Uh, they are responsible for the pump stations and they also um, would utilize a closed circuit television system. So we have a robotic camera that we utilize uh, in the sanitary sewers to investigate problems and also just to document condition so that we can be more aware of what is happening underground before a problem develops or before it becomes um, a major repair. And this system actually helps us diagnose our problems better and it also helps us save um, time and money when it comes to a repair because now we're very certain where that problem is and what the extent of that problem is before we put a shovel to the ground. And what I'd like to do is just um, start and let's, let's trace the, the water flow from someone's kitchen sink down through their, their drain and out to our sanitary sewer. And it obviously flows to the pump station mm -hmm. and then from the pump station it continues on until it eventually reaches a treatment plant. What happens to it in the treatment plan? How is it treated? Sure. Um, for example, when you flush your toilet, uh, the water would flow by gravity down uh, either to a basement or a uh, crawl space area, and it would flow through a trap at that point, uh, which is actually a very important component of your plumbing system to maintain. Uh, the trap acts very much like the trap under your sink uh, in the fact that it collects debris, and it also prevents unwanted sewer gases from entering the home. 
So uh, it's very important, one, that the trap is maintained on average maybe once a year is what we see, and also that your internal plumbing system is, uh, is watertight and airtight to prevent any of these gases from getting into your home. So once the water flows through the home, uh, it flows through the trap and it would leave the house, of course, and basically flows typically by gravity through the sewer lateral and then it hits the town sewer main. Then at that point, uh, depending on the location, the geography, it would flow by gravity um, to a lower point where it might be lifted or pumped, as you and Crate had spoke of earlier, um, to another part of the system where it can be carried uh, ultimately to the plant. Once the wastewater enters the sewer plant, is actually a, a large biochemical reactor where we promote the growth of certain type of microorganisms to degrade the waste before it's discharged into the river. To go through the entire treatment process, uh, wastewater is uh, lifted and first the settleable solids are removed, grit mainly, um, and large material is removed mechanically through racks and screens that would stop uh, pretty much anything and you would be surprised of what people try to flush down the sanitary sewer. Um, if someone intentionally wants to get something in there, they will try to and, and uh, we'll find it, either good or bad, uh, in the plant or in a pump somewhere. So it's very important for people not to artificially introduce anything um, that should inhibit the wastewater process into the sanitary sewer. Grit such as eggshells and coffee grinds are removed a second in the uh, grit, remo grit removal process where uh, after that water is uh, slowed down. So backing up intentionally in the collection system we're trying to maintain a certain velocity of the wastewater. If wastewater slows too much, solids will deposit into the system and cause a blockage. And if it flows too quickly, the same thing can happen. So what we're trying to do is uh, have a balancing point, maintaining a certain slope on a pipe and a diameter of a pipe in order to provide the capacity that's needed, but also to maintain a certain velocity. It's actually a, a very complex hydraulic analysis um, that requires quite a bit of engineering to determine the exact size of a sanitary sewer. In the treatment plant, we try to do the opposite. We slow the wastewater down so that we can purposely settle these solids out. In uh, our plant, is called a primary clara thickener, is where a solid settle to the bottom of a large circular tank and are collected and removed from the process. And then after these uh, settleable solids are removed, there's still amount of contamination in the water mainly due to um, carbon uh, material that can be reduced by microorganisms. So we actually utilize microorganisms in the wastewater process to purposely degrade the uh, soluble waste that's in the water after the settleable solids have been removed. We do this by maintaining certain uh, oxygen content in the aeration tank. And this tank is uh, a biochemical reactor where we purposely try to maintain the perfect living environment for these microorganisms. And once the waste has been degraded to that point, it would flow into a secondary set of settling tanks where we would actually settle out these bacteria and microorganisms, remove them from the process. And at that point, we uh, utilize a liquid chlorine solution to um, help disinfect and to inactivate viruses and bacteria that may still be in the wastewater after it's treated. Uh, and at that point, it's discharged into the Mohawk River. And really, most uh, wastewater treatment plants would operate with a variety of these types of unit processes that are all uh, operated and maintained by certified operators or a treatment plant and require quite a bit of expertise in order to perform the laboratory analysis and the process control analysis that are required to maintain that perfect living environment for the microorganisms. Now give us a timeline from the moment a drop of water reaches the treatment plant until it's discharged in the river. How long does it, does it stay in each step? That's a difficult question to answer because it depends on the flow coming into the plant. We have very little control on the amount of wastewater that comes into the plant or when it comes in. So we're uh, constantly making process control adjustments in order to accommodate these changing conditions at the plant. And that's really why our operators need to be so well trained is in order to, respect, uh, to respond to these changes in flow and concentration throughout the day. Uh, and at night, our facility is operated uh, through a series of computer systems 
that would make changes based upon the needs of the plant. Okay. And Tim, um, I'd like to ask you, what, what should customers know when it comes to maintaining their, their system in their home? You, know, you touched on it a little bit, but, but what else is mm -hmm. needed? Yes, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, there's a couple things, really. Um, one of the biggest things uh, t for us, when we get a uh, house call, for example, we call it a maintenance call, we'll respond to um, you know, a resident that's having a problem with their sewer. And uh, a lot of times, uh, maybe even as much as half of the calls that we receive are problems with their trap. So as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, very important to maintain that trap. Uh, and what I mean by that is usually there's two caps on top, typically, or at least one where you can get in there and actually use an auger to clean out that trap um, and basically remove the debris uh, and anything that might get caught in that trap. So that's one very important component to maintain. Um, the second thing is also something that we had talked about earlier is the sump pumps and uh, hopefully that they're not connected to the sanitary sewer. Um, like we had talked about, if there's a sump pump connected to the sanitary sewer, it can put a lot of strain on, on a sanitary sewer and basically cause us to treat a lot of clean water, which in turn could cost the residents more money to, in, to in, in effect, treat clean water down at the uh, plant. Um, the third thing that I want to mention is the fact that collection, for example, uh, our section, there's nine employees, and uh, we're a relatively small crew to maintain a large system, but uh, the residents really are an additional eyes and ears out there if there's any problems with the sewer. For example, sometimes you might get a call that there's a, a cover that's been dislodged off a manhole, uh, or maybe somebody's thrown something down a manhole and someone's noticed that. Uh, so it's really important, you know, if, if a resident's out there and they see something wrong, maybe someone's at our pump station that doesn't look like a town employee, to really to call us immediately so we can uh, address the situation. Okay, good, good. I'm, I'm sure there are a number of questions and, and subjects that, uh, concerning pure waters that we, we haven't touched on today. So. Great. If, if um, a resident wanted to contact the department, uh, what, what's the phone number? Um, is there an email address or, or can you direct them to the town website and, and where to go for, uh, for questions? And also, I as they're looking at the town's website and uh, the, the Pure Waters Division portion of the site, what information would they find on there? Well, our telephone number is 783-2766. And we're located in the Public Operations Center on Old Miskina Road in the same building as the building department, water, and highway. Uh, we're available uh, at the office from 8 to 4.30. Uh, and after that, we do have someone on call 24 hours a day. So that 783-2766 number is valid 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we also have our uh, website on colony.org. If you go to the main page, you can be redirected to the Pure Water section by clicking on Departments. And what you'll find on our webpage are, is information regarding permit fees, use fees, and really uh, forms that you may need in order to interact with our department, mainly in uh, repair of your sanitary sewer or if you needed to install a new sanitary sewer for a new home. Uh, because both installation and repairs require a permit from our division so that we can have inspectors verify that those lines are installed in accordance to the town requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Creighton, Tim, I appreciate you coming on today to, to talk about the Pure Waters Department. Again, if you have any questions concerning Pure Waters, the sanitary sewer system, um, feel free to, to call the number uh, during business hours, Monday through Friday. Any questions, you could always email uh, through the town's website, and, uh, and someone will get back to you. And thank you again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again soon with another uh, edition of Colony Close-Up. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.